My name's uh, Cornell Clayton. I'm the director of the Thomas S. Foley Institute here at WSU. And on behalf of the Institute, on behalf of our many partners, so many I can't name them all, but it includes the uh, College of Arts and Sciences and the Humanities Planning Group, uh, headed up by uh, Chris Lupke, who's it's also his birthday today, so everyone tell him happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. He did a great job uh, organizing uh, um, Bill McKibben's visit to WSU. Uh, so in any case, I want to welcome you out to our event today. We are honored to have with us Bill McKibben, who is a renowned author and environmentalist. He is the recipient of the 2014 Wright Livelihood Prize for work on behalf of the planet. His 1989 book, The End of Nature, is regarded as the first book for a general audience that discussed climate change and has appeared in more than 24 languages since that time, he's authored more than a dozen more books. His most recent one is entitled Oil and Honey, an Education of an Unlikely Activist. Uh, Bill is also the founder of 350.org, a worldwide grassroots climate change movement, which has organized more than 20,000 rallies around the world. Spearheaded the, uh, spearheaded the resistance to the Keystone Pipeline and launched the fossil fuel disinvestment movement. The Schumann Distinguished Scholar in Environmental Studies at Mid Middlebury College and a Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Bill was the 2013 winner of the Gandhi Prize and the Thomas Merton Prize, and he holds honorary degrees from more than 18 colleges and universities around the world. A former staff writer for The New Yorker, he writes frequently for a wide variety of publications, including the New York Review of Books, National Geographic, and Rolling Stone. Foreign Policy named him to their list of the world's 100 most important global thinkers, and the Boston Globe called him America's most important environmentalist. Join me now in welcoming Bill Moon. Thank you, Craig. That was a very overkind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's been a lot of fun to be at WSU. It's really fun to be in this suite of offices. The minute I walked in the door, I knew that it was a faithful not even recreation, uh, faithful uh, shrine. Um, um, uh, it looks, when you walk in the other side, just like any of the, those of you who've been to Capitol Hill know that that's what all the offices up and down the uh, wide granite halls of the House and Senate office buildings look like inside. And, and it is a very good setting to be talking about <coughs> politics, which I'm going to try to do just briefly today, and then I hope We'll have a discussion. Um, and I'm, I have the I, for me, this I've got the good vantage point because I can look over your heads at this amazing collection of buttons and pins and things from America's campaign history, which you all should take a moment at sometime. Um, one of the things that I think is important to say, it was important for me to figure out, is that we have a tendency when we talk about politics to confuse that with elections. Um, elections are an important part of politics, but a relatively small part of it. Election day will be an important day on the political calendar, but really for the purposes of people working for social change, or indeed for the purposes of <coughs> lobbyists working to keep the status quo intact, uh, the day after election day is just as important, and the day after that, and the day after that. Um, um, and. That's the kind of political work that uh, I and my colleagues engage in as we build big movements to pressure systems here and around the world. And it's that kind of pressure that I want to talk about. Um, and I want to begin by saying that it is necessary no matter, usually, no matter what political system you're engaged with, whether it's the US Congress or the Board of Trustees of a university or a city council or anything else, to figure out how, in some ways, to apply some pressure. Um, it's very necessary to win, or at least uh, break even in whatever argument about data and uh, things that you're engaged in, um, to have all the reports and numbers and statistics close to hand. But in general, important fights don't hinge in the end on, um, on reason or argument. They hinge in the end on power. Uh, and so the ability to exercise some power, uh, the ability to make uh, the decision makers who will be carrying out the decision uh, uh, respect you and uh, uh, perhaps fear you some or hope for some reward from you, 
is an important part of this game. And the very best of those leaders um, recognize that and embrace it. Uh, one of the watchwords for me is an old quote from Franklin Delano Roosevelt, arguably the greatest president America ever had. Uh, um, I guess Lincoln would be the other half of the argument. Um, and FDR at one point was sitting with a bunch of people who'd come in to argue for some good cause or another, and he listened, heard them out, and he said, um, I said, okay, I agree with you, now go make me do it. And <laughs> what he meant was go build the uh, series of movements, of coalitions, of pressures that would uh, uh, make it possible for him to do that thing that he wanted to do, um, but that would be politically difficult to do otherwise. And that kind of pressure we see every single day in political life, and sometimes we see it you know, in fairly dramatic terms. Right now we're in the middle of a um, presidential race, so it's almost a laboratory for watching close up, more close up and transparently than we usually, usually can see what it is that go that's going on. So for instance, I've been paying a lot of attention to the race for the Democratic uh, uh, president, presidential nomination. And part of the reason, and we can talk about this later, is because Bernie's an old friend of mine and a fellow Vermonter, and I've been working with him and all that. But mostly it's because this is the best moment we'll probably have over the course of the next eight years to push the party, its probable nominee, so on and so forth, much further to uh, uh, the left on environmental issues than she would <coughs> like to go. Um, we'll be insulated, it'll be much harder to put pressure on her. So what we've done for the last six months is have a team of six or seven college age people um, who have been what we call bird dogging all the candidates all over New Hampshire, Iowa, and now the other states, all the places where when a race is still contested, they're forced to actually come out in the open for a little while and wander along rope lines and <coughs> shake hands with people and answer questions from time to time. And these young people have been doing a remarkable job. <coughs> They're the ones that have, you know, between the pressure that Bernie has been applying by winning lots of votes and lots of states and things, uh, 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 and the constant presence of these people trying to move the debate along, it's been interesting to watch just how quickly some of that evolution has come. I mean, Hillary Clinton was six months ago in favor of the Keystone Pipeline still, and then, uh, then she wasn't. Uh, and people kept asking her about um, the new uh, proposed Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement, an agreement that she basically wrote with her colleagues. And there was enough pressure applied, it became clear enough that this was a divisive enough issue that she would be in trouble if she didn't, electoral trouble if she didn't, that, you know, on one of the, another one of these shaky handheld iPhone video things that people were making, she came out against it. And so on, on and on and on, um, down the, um, down a long list of things. And uh, this week, since the actions in New York, where fracking has been the single biggest political issue, at least in upstate New York for the last three or four years, the same process being carried out there and m moving her along. Um, that pressure is incredibly important to apply for social movements because one has to understand that every single day, 365 days a year, the forces of the status quo are applying enormous pressure from their side. The sheer amount of money spent by, say, major <laughs> corporations lobbying uh, Washington is almost beyond belief. And that is without serious pushback from campaigns like the ones we've tried to build, then we will lose every single time. And, and um, that's just always the thing to bear in mind that left to their own devices, our institutions will favor those who have wealth and power. Um, um, that's, it's not, it's not even necessary to think of it fair, unfair, or anything else. That's just, consider it a kind of law of physics uh, in the political world. 
that's what one expects if unless people can figure out how to intervene. And it's so um, it's so much that way that it's hard sometimes even for people in Washington to kind of remember how enmeshed in that system they are. I remember the year we started this fight over the Keystone Pipeline and it became a big deal. That December, Politico magazine, the sort of big insider magazine there, had their annual uh, <coughs> sort of public event and the, the public event had uh, the, the final session for all of these sort of Washington elite had me who knew almost nothing about Washington. I was just beginning to learn anything. Um, Ed Markey, now a senator from Massachusetts, and a guy named Lee Terry, then a congressman from Nebraska who was one of the biggest backers of this Keystone Pipeline. And they were, you know, though there were other uh, the, the conversation where everyone was doing their best to keep it civil as one does at such things. And, things. and um, um, uh, at one point, though, one of the reporters said, um, to me, he said, why do you think Congress is you know, so insistent on getting this thing passed if it's such a bad idea? And I, without even sort of thinking about it, I just sort of said, well, that's you know, remarkably obvious. It's because they've taken huge sums of money from the oil industry, and the oil industry has huge influence, and so of course, and this fellow sitting next to me, Lee Terry, bridled at this. He'd taken a huge sum of money from the fossil fuel industry. <laughs> Are you saying that we're that we're bought off and just and, and part of me, you know, I'm a, from the sticks and I'm a Methodist Sunday school teacher and I like to be nice and you know I'm sort of used to kind of normal interchange with other human beings and I felt a little bad and I said, oh well, I, but then after a minute I just thought I just said, well, you do know, right, that everybody in America thinks that that. That's how it works because that's how it is does work, and it's because all of us know that if someone gave us fifty thousand dollars or something, we know how we would feel in in response. I mean, and, and Lee Terry was virtually the only Republican who went down to defeat in the uh, uh, the twenty fourteen. Um, midterm elections because people in Nebraska were getting very sick of the pipeline that he had been um, pimping for. Um, <laughs> environmental politics forgot these rules for a long time. Okay, um, It's a very interesting case study. The environmental movement was born in 1970, April of 1970, for all practical purposes with the first birthday. It was a triumph of organizing. 20 million Americans were in the streets, one in 10 of the then American population. There's never been anything like it in American history, and probably in very few other places. It was enough, that show of force, to guarantee that everything that the environmental movement asked for happened. I, I remember talking to Pete McCloskey, the Republican, uh, the, almost the only Republican who'd been willing to ally himself with the forces around Earth Day uh, beforehand. And McCloskey, who was a great guy, um, uh, recalled how the next day after Earth Day, he got to his office uh, on Capitol Hill, and he said there was a line of about 15 of his, you know, Republican colleagues, sort of around the, you know, sort of standing in the hall waiting to talk to him, and they all, they all kept just saying, "Tell us about this ecology thing. What is this?" You know, all of a sudden it was real, because people were out in numbers talking about it. Richard Nixon the least environmental human being that you could imagine. Um, um, a man, famous, the famous picture of Richard Nixon walking on the beach in Santa Barbara uh, wearing his um, you know, black Oxford wingtips. You know? um, 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 he signed every important piece of environmental legislation that we have, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Endangered Species Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, all in a four or five year period, not because he supported any of them. We know from listening to the Watergate tapes that he hated all of it and hated environmentalists and thought they were cave dwelling hippies and on and on and on and on. But he signed them because he had no choice. Uh, this current that people had built, the organite was so strong. The environmental movement um, got used to that, got used to winning, and uh, um, figured that they would win every battle and quite, you know, 
understandably, sort of settled down into business as usual in DC and built huge offices for big organizations. And for five, 10, 15, 20 years, into the mid 1980s, really, it worked pretty well. They won pretty much everything. And, and, uh, and they stopped doing the organizing. And then um, the other guys started really fighting back pretty effectively. It was the sagebrush rebellion in the West, the rise of the uh, of fossil fuel industry as a really powerful force, uh, on and on and on. Um, passing note, a terrific book to read about all this is Jane Mayer's new book called Dark Money, uh, profiling the um, Koch brothers and their uh, other billionaires who have become deeply politically engaged. And it's much of the action takes place in this period. So they began to win. Uh, more and more and more of the time, and the environmental movement didn't know what to do because it wasn't really a movement anymore, it was a collection of organizations. And it's really only in the last seven, eight, nine years that we've tried building the movement back up again. I think the right analogy is that there was a lot of energy in the battery after April 1970, and that battery was powerful enough to propel this thing forward for quite a while, but eventually the energy ran out. and so. You know, all over the world, we've been holding, I could show you, because we've organized 20,000 demonstrations in every country on Earth, I could show you these pictures till the end of time, okay? Um, and they're fun and <coughs> beautiful, and the same dynamic playing out all over the planet as we kind of rebuild a movement and give it some of the heft it needs to uh, go to work. And, uh, um, um, the reason that you need movements, obviously, is because um, is because the rest of us don't have the precious asset that the status quo usually has, which is large sums of money. Okay, um, that's what their power is mostly based on. The fossil fuel industry being the perfect case in point. It's the richest industry the world's ever seen, and they've spent that money constantly in order to maintain their particular perks, the most important of which is alone among industries, they're allowed to use the atmosphere as an open sewer for their product. I mean, carbon is arguably the most dangerous thing in the world, but it carries no price. You can pour it for free into the atmosphere, which is the sweetheart deal of all sweetheart deals. It explains why this is the richest industry on earth. Um, so the only way to counter that is to figure out a different currency to work in. And the currencies of movements are passion, spirit, creativity, and sometimes the willingness to spend one's body and go to jail. And that's how it has been for a long time and probably how it will be. There are subtle shifts as we move through the digital age and things like that, but much of it looks very much like it used to. So. The Keystone Pipeline fight is a good case in point. We wanted to see if the climate movement that we'd been building had reached the point where it was ready for this kind of confrontation and engagement. We asked people to come to Washington and engage in civil disobedience, which is a high stakes thing to ask people to do, okay? Um, it's always difficult to say, are you willing to come and go to jail? Um, because it's not an easy thing to do. But in movement after movement, it's been one of the ways that we underlined the moral seriousness of problems that we faced and put things that people didn't really focus on yet straight into the middle of the news cycle. And so it was with this. This Keystone Pipeline was a done deal. Every pipeline, in fact, every oil project ever like it before had been approved and approved easily. Big oil had never lost a fight. We decided to try and take a stand of some sort or another. And the beginning of that stand was 1,200 and some people going to jail um, over the course of a couple of weeks. It was the biggest civil disobedience action about anything in this country in almost 30 years. And that was enough to begin to sort of kick things off, you know, to get them going. And quickly spread around the world and back to America. We followed the president that fall of 2011, every place he went, um, um, making as much noise as we could, respectful noise, because remember, most of the people engaged in this work had voted for uh, and supported President Obama, so it was an uneasy um, um, situation in certain ways, but we were, we told everybody, come 
where are your Obama buttons when you come to get arrested? Our job is to give him the space he needs to do to be the guy he, we want, he wants to be, and uh, which was not quite true, but, <laughs> um, um, but, but true enough, you know, in, in some sense, okay? And, and so it started to work, I mean, and it, it helped catalyze a movement that became a sort of the iconic environmental campaign of its time, uh, you know, and we managed all kinds of stunts. We sent 800,000 emails on the same day to the Senate, the most they'd ever gotten. We filed more public comments on an infrastructure project, and it, we started having progressively bigger demonstrations, you know, 50,000 people in Washington, and then 100,000, and it grew and it grew and kept growing, until finally, really, we'd left the President Obama no choice but to do what he finally did, which was last fall to veto it. it really, at that point, uh, really within a couple of years, it was clear that he couldn't approve it without sacrificing his sort of environmental bona fides and that it would, we'd managed to make it a kind of legacy issue. The good news is, much more important than that, was that it proved in a way that we hadn't quite imagined to be a very good training school <coughs> for further resistance. That is, having shown that big oil could in fact be beaten, lots of people in lots of places decided that they could take on the fossil fuel industry too. The head of the American, I was saying yesterday, the head of the American Natural Gas Association gave a speech last year in which to his <coughs> colleagues, in which he said, we somehow have to stop the keystoneization of every project that we're building, because they're losing now over and over and over again. In Washington State, they lost the fight to build a huge coal port out at Cherry Point. They're going to lose the fight to put one in at Longview. Um, I think there's a reasonable chance they're going to lose the battle to build the big oil terminal they want to build in Vancouver, Washington. Um, um, because there's inspired resistance by all, not by me, by all kinds of people all over the place now. Um, and with great coalitions emerging, indigenous people often in the lead, uh, frontline communities, people who, and, and then climate scientists and faith communities and all the people that kind of get drawn in when these things happen. That's good because stopping one pipeline is not an efficient way to stop climate change. What one plays for in this kind of work, usually, at least on this kind of scale, is to change the zeitgeist, to use whatever campaigns you can to change the way in which we think as a nation, as a world, about fossil fuel. To take it from the point where it's regarded as a kind of inevitable whatever to the point where it's regarded as a, a, a plague and something where we have to as quickly as possible get past and get through and, and whatever else. And we've, I think, begun to turn that corner. You could see that happen most powerfully in the last few years with what happened with the tremendous organizing around gay marriage in this country. Okay? And it's, we're now almost at the point where it's, that it's, where it's so non-controversial that we forget how quickly and powerfully it happened. Four years ago, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton were still dead against gay marriage, okay? and had been for years. And it was Bill Clinton who signed a whole series of laws to make it impossible for states to do it, on and on and on. Okay? But terrific organizing took us to the point where it just seemed obvious to people that this was the right way to go. Um, you know, where it was, became absurd to think of denying people the right to have a wedding uh, simply because of who they wanted to marry. And, well, and now, you know, even conservative Republican politicians really don't want much to do with the issue and wish that it would go away. It's no longer a winner for them in any way and so on. We're getting to that same place with climate change. Four years ago, Barack Obama and Mitt Romney managed literally not to mention the word during their presidential campaign until Hurricane Sandy, with four or five days to go before the election, made it impossible. Even then, they mentioned it barely. But it had been in neither one's interest for different reasons to talk about climate change. That'll be very different this time. We've changed the mood of the country enough, we and Mother Nature doing her thing, okay, that uh, whoever the Democratic nominee is is going to be beating the Republicans with uh, a climate change stick day after day after day. They're going to be in a very tough position. Their <coughs> bread and butter funding out of the Koch brothers and the fossil fuel industry makes it very hard for them to backtrack, but they're you know, in an exposed position because they're having to argue that 
physics and chemistry are don't actually operate, and that's a hard position to maintain, you know, and still look like a serious candidate for the most important office in the world. Uh, so that's the, the kind of work that, that we try to do day after day, and civil disobedience is one of the things that makes it possible. Public witness of all kinds is another that makes it possible, so we do a lot of work all over the world to make people understand the, these are just pictures but from a series of rallies we did called Connect the Dots in all the places in the world that people had already suffered huge damage from climate change and they were many and far flung. Um, um, and then we now have enough, you know, we've now built a, uh, um, a movement large enough that we can really start to put pressure uh, in, in you know, ever bigger ways. This was the march we organized in September of 2014 in New York that was the biggest demonstration about anything in America in many years. Bigger than we had expected. We'd hoped very much that we'd be, be able to get 150 or 200,000 people out in New York, and that's what we'd organized to do and so on. As it turned out when the day came, and only occasionally does this happen, but sometimes, you know, you just hit the timing and the we have about 400,000 people in the street in New York, which was difficult to manage logistically, um, but everybody was in a good mood. They didn't mind the fact that they were standing on 6th Avenue for hours waiting to march because there were so many people marching in front of them, you know. And it was turned out to be one of those times when it was really important. I mean, six weeks later, addressing the UN, Obama said, well, when people march, we have to listen. The difference between the Copenhagen Climate Conference in 2009 and the Paris one in 2015, the first of which completely failed, nothing came out of it at all, and the second of which succeeded to one degree or another, uh, was that there was an, well, there were two differences. One, the price of a solar panel had fallen 80% in the interim, and the second was that there was now a movement that could hold people's feet to the fire. Barack Obama came back from Copenhagen having accomplished nothing, Hillary Clinton having overseen the sort of great diplomatic failure since Munich, maybe, uh, and they paid no real price for it. There was no real uh, uh, price to be paid. Now there would have been a price to be paid here and around the world, so people made sure that something happened anyway. All of this happens against the backdrop of deeply dysfunctional political system, okay? which is an important thing to remember. I mean, sitting in Speaker Foley's office in a certain way, we're sitting nostalgically back in uh, a political system that wasn't quite as gridlocked and dysfunctional as the one we inhabit now. Okay? And it's, so it's important to just, again, it's just kind of a law of physics, at least a temporary one, uh, around which one must orient one's work. Um, um, that dysfunction is caused by huge sums of money. I mean, think about the distortion that happens to a political system when the Koch brothers announce that they're going to spend $900 million on this year's election, more than the Republicans or the Democrats spend on the last election. Two guys, okay? Uh, uh, and think of the way that that, uh, uh, you know, intimidates people on the other side, intimidates people on their own side, so on and so forth, stifles debate. On a larger sense, the dysfunction of our political life now is felt around the world, those Paris Accords being a good idea, a good example. They didn't produce a treaty in Paris. There's no international treaty. There are no timetables. There's no enforcement. There's none of that. The reason is because, and it's quite explicit if you talk to any foreign minister around the world, everybody around the world has recognized that our political system is so broken that there's no possibility that any reasonable treaty would ever get the two-thirds vote in the U.S. Senate that's required for its ratification. So the entire world had to rejigger how it did this sort of stuff and come up with a series of kind of voluntary pledges, nation by nation, none of which can actually be enforced except through some kind of, you know, uh, peer pressure, really, um, um, all to get around the fact that, you know, the fossil fuel industry has a lock on our Congress that prevents action. That's bad and regrettable and needs to change. I'm really glad that there are 
hundreds of my friends and colleagues in Washington this week getting arrested in what they're calling democracy spring in an effort to try and, if I wasn't here, I'd be with them, to try and slow down, you know, get people to think again about Citizens United and whatever. But that's going to be a hard, long fight. It won't happen easily. And in the meantime, we have problems like climate change that we have to figure out how to address because they're timed problems. If we don't get climate change right quickly, we will never get it right. It, it, you know, it's not like other issues in some ways. I said yesterday, Dr. King always used to, used to say about civil rights, and at the end of his speeches he'd say, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. This may take a while, but we're going to win, okay? Which was a comforting thing for people to know, still is, since we haven't won yet on civil rights. <coughs> In the case of climate change, the arc of the physical universe is short, and it bends toward heat. And if we don't win soon, then it uh, becomes a moot question in a lot of ways. So we have to figure out ways, even in the current political climate, to allow that to happen. Um, um, and that's one reason why um, the, the, and I'll end here, the current uh, political race is so interesting. Um, really the fight, um, the, the sort of philosophical difference, I think, between uh, Senator Sanders and Secretary Clinton is whether one favors a kind of slower, more evolutionary change, which actually I think in most cases is how humans and their institutions change best, or whether one favors a dramatic attempt at a dramatic, sharp, what he's calling a revolution. And in the case of climate change, unfortunately, we're probably at the point where only some kind of truly dramatic shift, some attempt to really make things, to make some much of a sharp, clean break with how we've been doing things and move aggressively <coughs> in one direction, offers us any real chance anymore of dealing with the physics of climate change. We're miles behind that physics. And as I said to people this morning when we were having this discussion with the faculty, um, the important thing to remember about climate change and politics is it's not the kind of issue that we're used to dealing with. It's not the kind of issue that Tom Foley spent his life kind of adjudicating, where you have two sides, and basically you end up meeting someplace near the middle and coming back five years later to do it again and move. This discussion, though it obviously has plenty of those, you know, environmentalists <coughs> versus industry, Democrats versus Republicans, Global North versus Global South, it has all of those, but what it really is a negotiation between is human beings and physics. And that's a difficult negotiation for political systems to understand because physics is not a talented negotiator, okay? It doesn't, it's not interested in, in negotiation, in compromise, in meeting halfway. Uh, given the warning we've been given by scientists, our job is to close that distance. So those are the um, elementary and to you guys probably already completely obvious observations I have to make about political life, and I'd love to hear what you guys are thinking about any of this, but thank you Great. very much. Thank you. So, uh, we have about 25 minutes for questions and answers. Maybe I'll start it off. I just want to ask you a question. I want to drag you back to party politics. Mm. Um, you know, Richard Nixon signed those major environmental laws mm. because uh, there was the environmental movement has traction within the Republican Party as well as the Democratic Party. Yeah. Um, in a period of highly polarized politics, to get policy change, both parties have to uh, be on board. And so, I was interested in your, your talk, you almost talked exclusively about Democratic mm -hmm. politics. Um, what's the strategy for getting Republicans on board? And at this point, there is no strategy, mm -hmm. and there's no particular hope of it. Um, um, uh, and that won't change until, I mean, the, the only real strategy is to change the zeitgeist enough that their position becomes uh, becomes unsustainable within the current political mood, at which point they will then be willing to come to the negotiating table in some way, and then they'll start having the conversation we should have had 25 years ago if the fossil fuel industry hadn't gotten in the way, which is what set of steps should we take? And there are plenty of interesting steps that would be, you know, that uh, uh, 
market-oriented conservatives could probably figure out how to get behind if they didn't have some option of not dealing with it. You know, a price on carbon is something that uh, economists left, right, and center have all said is obvious common sense policy. Why wouldn't you? Why would you allow this to continue to be an externality forever that you can avoid dealing with? I mean, there's no real reason. And there are plans like the you know revenue neutral fee and dividend. Uh, carbon pricing scheme that people are working hard, like the citizens' climate lobby, to interest Republican politicians and things in. But the way that the current, when you have a, a, a party dependent I mean, <coughs> of the, uh, I've had these, I'm going to blow these numbers slightly, but of the 35 members of the, um, 35 Republican members of the House Energy and Resources, Natural Resources Subcommittee, Something like 33 per 33 of them have serious funding from the Koch brothers. It's just not a. That's not a world where we're going to move until the mood of the country has shifted enough that it's no longer tenable for that to happen. And of course, that's harder too in a nation that we've. When people talk a lot about Citizens United and things, but an equally difficult problem is that we've gerrymandered our political districts to the point where. Um, you know, people don't have, the, the, all they fear, are, all Republicans fear are someone emerging even farther to their right in the primary and taking them on, you know. And that's, that's a grave problem too, and, uh, um, and an interesting one. So my question to you, by the way, welcome and thank mm -hmm. you for being here. It's a, it's a great honor to head on our campus. <coughs> my question is about <coughs> the environmental movement's take on injured third parties. When uh, big decisions are made, and I was involved as an analyst uh, in Spotted Owl Country uh, during the Spotted Owl Controversy, and I studied loggers and logging communities. Yep. And in the end, um, whatever you think of the outcome, Weyerhaeuser won, and the small mom and pop logging companies uh, and their workers lost, and there's still deep anger yep. in the timber country as a result of that. Um, and the compensation that the government offered was, was minuscule and almost insulting in some ways to the, to the people, because it really didn't address the needs for employment, et cetera. So my question to you is about coal country. It looks to me like coal miners are about to go off the cliff, and people in the environmental movement are perhaps helping to push them mm -hmm. off the cliff. But what are you advocating? So what people are advocating for is, and have been for years, is what's called just transition, is the mm -hmm. phrase that the labor movement and others have been using. And every bill that's been introduced, the Clean Power Plan or else, has a fairly elaborate set of retraining mechanisms, all the kind of things you'd, you'd sort of design if you were trying to design something like this. It's, of course, been the coal industry and their political enablers who have been the ones opposed to this all along, because they understand that in the political calculus, the best thing for them to do is to hold as many hostages as they can, as long as they can, okay? To make it uh, uh, impossible for people in coal country, for instance, to imagine some other future, so, so they will stay completely engaged in this you know, fight. Meanwhile, of course, what has the coal industry been doing? By endless mechanization, it's cut its workforce by four fifths. <coughs> There's now far more people putting up solar panels in this country than mining coal. And, of course, also the fossil fuel industry, the coal industry in particular, has been as venal as it is possible to be to its own employees, setting up, for instance, a kind of series of essentially companies designed to fail and offloading all their contracts onto them so that their pension obligations would magically disappear. Look up, say, Patriot Coal formed five years ago yeah. uh, if you want to see kind of perfect example of a shell game that people play. So all, all that's so true. What one's hoping, what one hopes for is this work for just transition, and it's precisely what the environmental community and mm -hmm. the politicians that are working with them have worked hard on. It sounds like way too little and way too well, late. Sure. The I coal mean, industry is mm -hmm. so evil, it just seems to me that if the environmental community could get the workers on their side on this issue. But you haven't offered enough. You well, haven't offered enough. How do you, but how, the point I'm trying to make is you don't have, you can't offer enough because the 
the bank that you need to offer something from is owned by Congress, and Congress is owned by people who understand that it's in their political interest not to make that offer, right? I well, mean, they advocate is hard for the workers. Yeah, I'm the environment. Well, sure. I mean, and that's people work hard on all these things, but that's a glib thing to say, absent, you know, some some strategy to do it, you know. Um, but yeah, it requires a lot of money. I'd like to make a comment. Yes, you make comments. Comments. First of all, my name is David Benson, and I'm a scientist, and it's not carbon, it's carbon dioxide. There's a world of difference. The next thing is, good, we have too much carbon dioxide, let's put it back. I'm also an engineer, and I believe in really big projects. And Bill, if you would take this little card here, it's got a couple papers on it about a really big project. Now you take the world deserts, irrigate them, Water. Oh my, this is getting to be a really big project. We can hire all of those coal mines. <laughs> and lots more. Because we're going to take the world's desert and we're going to grow trees, which will take the carbon dioxide out of the air and put it back where it belongs, namely in these trees. This is a huge project. How much do we need? Do you have a question? Well, you have a question? According to that, I will go on and just stop at the moment. Uh, according to that, <coughs> we need the Sahara Desert and the Australian Desert. And maybe more. I'm on my so way to Australia this afternoon. I don't know so how I'll, to do any of the I'll politics the word. associated with making this happen. Thank you. And thank you for those references. I am. I, indeed I am. Thank you. I do you want to follow up a bit on your answer to uh, Cornell? You know, if the cost of carbon falls to the oil companies, they'll just pass it on as they always do to the consumers. So the first problem there is if you disaggregate the data with respect to gender on fossil fuel usage, for example, in driving cars, there's been some great studies done in Canada, it turns out that you penalize women more than men because of the average ways that women use cars, which is multiple destination trips, usually serving the needs of other members of the family, like food and dropping them off and picking them up, etc. So there's that issue of how you get a differential impact of that kind of resolution or solution. But the second thing is, what they will also do is they'll just pay it. You know, it's like oil spills. Oh, well, if we do, you know, if our rig spills, we'll get a fine. We'll just bill that in and assume into the budget that we're going to have to pay it. And now we'll just do the spill and not worry about it because we can pay the fine. Yeah. And if that happens... That's not how it works in this case. So you don't think that ultimately then it just becomes an enclosure no. movement? No, so think about it. So, so run the... So, I mean, we, we, we could talk for a long time about carbon pricing and, you know, there's lots of problems. But the, you know, you know, in its largest respects, it works pretty simply. I mean, posit a system, this is the kind of revenue neutral being dividend system that people in time about. Well, you set, you can set a honking price on carbon at the wellhead, whatever, uh, uh, enough that Exxon would have to raise the price of a gallon of gasoline to, you know, uh, European levels, which would be a good thing in and of itself, since Europeans on average use half as much energy <coughs> as Americans. Um, you know, that's in, in its largest sense a good thing for all of us to pay a lot if we're not made bankrupt in the process. And so the way that you keep that from happening in the largest frame is to take that money you're collecting from the Exxons of the world and just write a check to everybody in the country every six months or something for their share of it. Uh, pretty much the equivalent, but in a certain way in reverse, of what Alaska has been doing with the permanent the oil dividend fund, the permanent dividend fund for many years. Um, um, and if you do the numbers, about 80% of Americans come out ahead when you do that. Okay? They have more money than they would have had otherwise, even though they're paying a lot more at the pump. Um, um, the problems, I don't know about the gender one, that strikes me as less politically problematic than the fact that the, ge the geographic distribution of those costs would be different. You know, there's places like the Pacific Northwest that already have a ton of hydro, and so your check would, you'd be getting more money than someone in Pennsylvania, you know, in, in net at the end of the year, and those kind of things would be difficult to sort out um, in Congress. But the theory is, I mean, there's no excuse for not having a price on carbon going into the atmosphere. And, and actually, I mean, 
if you put the price up, I mean, Exxon not just going to write a check for it. I mean, it's, you're talking trillions of dollars. They have no choice but to pass it along, which is what one wants to happen, right? So, but that's, it's, it's the right way to be thinking and a good question. Do you and think it'll stop it in time? No, I don't think it's, as I say, I don't think it's going to happen in time because I don't think, I think at the moment we're unlikely, I mean, the scenario where you were able to get a uh, majority of the American Congress to do something serious about uh, climate change, the carbon price, in the time that we have is, I think, difficult to foresee. Not impossible. Changes, you know, events may conspire, Mother Nature is doing her best, so on and so forth. But it's, it's a stretch. That's why, in essence, much of the work that we're doing when we block pipelines, when we run these huge divestment campaigns that have dramatically altered the cost of capital for fossil fuel providers versus renewable energy suppliers, a lot of that work is an effort to impose what in effect is a de facto carbon tax where one <coughs> can't be imposed de jure to make it expensive uh, to operate um, um, this system as expensive as possible. And the reason that it's important and possible to imagine that all working is that we're not in a static situation. Every month, the price of the solar panel drops another one or two percent, okay? So if we can hold the fossil fuel industry in check at any point, and increasingly we can, then they're undercut month by month by month by the rapid progress of that. So what Exxon fears in part is us because we're demanding, we now have uncovered enough documents to make it clear that Exxon is, you know, was engaged for 30 years in the biggest corporate scandal of all time, covering up their knowledge of climate change. And the attorney generals of New York and California are investigating, and that's not a, so they don't like that. But what they also really don't like is that Elon Musk just got 300,000 orders for his electric car inside of a week because the world where everybody runs on electric cars and you've got a solar panel on your roof to provide the power is a world that doesn't actually need Exxon very badly anymore, you know? So that's why they're having, that's why you see the Cook brothers all of a sudden last week announcing the launch of a big new campaign to uh, make it difficult to have electric cars, you know, to screw up the, uh, uh, what small subsidies there are for solar and electric and so on. So I don't think any of this is easy, obvious, anything else. And I, I frankly think it's probably, not, though it's a perfectly logical thing, I don't think we're probably going to get the carbon tax that we want in time. But uh, we're, so we're going to have to do it in as many ways as we can. Very good question. Bill, just one quick back point. Uh, Peabody and Arch Cole declared bankruptcy, I think, this morning. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so, so as far as your thesis <laughs> earlier uh, supporting, now here's the question. So I was talking to a mutual friend of ours, Mr. Mike Rosell, who is a mountaintop removal um, activist and one of the founders of Earth First and, and does CD. And mm -hmm. he, he told me to um, tell you the truth. He thought you were a softy. Mm -hmm. Actually, he didn't use that word. But, but, um, but I would, it, since you've been talking about CD, I was kind of hoping that you would address the spectrum from somebody like Mike, who, you know, has spent a lot of time with three hots and a cot in a prison cell and yourself that spent some time but not nearly as much. So yeah, just I don't, perspective. I don't think it's the only tool in an activist toolkit and not the most important one actually. And I think like any tool used constantly, it gets dull, literally and figuratively. So I always hesitate to uh, overuse uh, the act of, um, of disobeying the law. That said, we're having in May a huge six continent, uh, what we're calling Break Free 2016. Um, uh, there'll be very what we call escalated protest on every continent except Antarctica um, at the big carbon deposits around the world that need to stay in the ground. And, you know, so for instance, in Washington state, there'll be a lot of people sitting down on the train tracks in Anacortes uh, at the, um, where the Tesoro and Shell refineries there are on the coast because they want to build new rail spurs to bring yet more train car loads full of oil in from the Bakken in North Dakota and maybe the tar sands too. Um, and people will be doing their best to uh, 
start the process of stopping them. So I think it's a, a good thing to do, but I don't I think it's a dumb thing to get um, uh, obsessed with any particular way of doing anything. So I, I really like your call for action. Uh, and it's, if I'm, uh, if I read into your uh, message, if you really like us professors to urge our own students to rise up and act. Um, no, I mean, you, I don't. Before and you, so my question before is, you urge your own students to rise up and act, <laughs> rise up and act yourself. Um, <laughs> you know, um, and see if perhaps they'll want to join in too, or see what they're doing and then join in with them. But go back to your question, uh, which I do actually. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know. get in trouble for, but that's no, okay. No, I know. You're the exact yeah. Uh, example. Yeah. 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 Right. So the question is, 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 to what extent would you like to see the classroom politicized? Uh, I don't particularly think it's important to politicize the classroom itself. Um, 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 I think most of this kind of work falls into the, as saying this morning, falls into the category of citizenship. And it's the thing that's incumbent upon us to do after work and on weekends, you know, that's when most movements and things get built. Now we can find plenty of things to do in our daily work that help, you know, whatever it is we're doing. And it's very good to be teaching about social movements and things, but I don't think the classroom's the place to be organizing protests or, you know, organizing lobbying campaigns or anything else. Um, um, but hopefully the skills that are imparted there uh, are the ones that then can be brought immediately into play as we act as citizens are supposed to act. Citizens of a nation, citizens of a world, but also citizens of a college community. In looking ahead uh, for a better future, um, I think I heard you say that uh, um, the concentrator chapel uh, held by individuals like uh, the brothers uh, is definitely one book that we need to, to uh, deal with. Um, in, in concrete terms, uh, for instance, that $900 million that Google Earth is talking about uh, would turn into <coughs> retail ads in the media. Um, so um, I, I know that you're not speci specializing in media, but based on your own experience through activism, I'd like to get your take on the current uh, structure of the media works for networks for this kind of activity. It doesn't work very well for certainly for this sort of stuff and it's difficult to get it I and mean, we spent when we started the Keystone thing, we spent several months trying to get anyone to cover it. Okay. Worked very hard. Happily we now have just enough of our own media that we can kind of make ourselves, you know, through the series of blah that we were able to sort of get things rolling. Get enough just enough so that people who the kind of people who would like to come to Washington and get arrested would know that such a thing was happening. We were able to get that much kind of notice out. And then eventually, if you do things long enough, creatively enough, dramatically enough, the media almost has no choice but to begin to kind of grudgingly cover it. And then at a certain point, once things become a story, I mean, at a certain point, there was way too much coverage of the Keystone thing to the exclusion of a hundred other fights that were going on. because. You know, the media has a fairly simple brain, and once things get in it, you know, they really get stuck in it, and, and that's how uh, campaigns become iconic, you know, um, in, in certain ways. To go back to what you were saying before about the concentration of power and wealth, it's worth noting that, you know, one possible really good outcome of where we are right now is you can imagine a world powered very differently than the one that's the moment, powered by mostly renewable energy, which is has the peculiar property of being ubiquitous but diffuse, okay? Um, as opposed to its exact opposite of uh, fossil fuel, which is highly concentrated, very rich and very dense and highly concentrated, very dense in BTUs, you know? So what that meant, the world of fossil fuel meant that the people who happen to live on top of it or control those small patches of ground with coal and gas and oil became very powerful, uh, far more powerful than was healthy. The Koch brothers being an example, the Saudi royal family being an example, you know, so on and so forth. A world that was powered differently 
would it wouldn't change everything about it, but it would be the beginning or a beginning of a very powerful shift, transformation in balance of, of power. Uh, um, if every community is able to provide this most important commodity more or less for itself, then the rules begin to shift a little bit about who has control of things and, and where things are going. So that's, I mean, that's an interesting world that, that starts to grow if we can get there. I think we'll get, I think, I think we would get there um, over time. I think the only question really at this point is whether the drag that will be exerted by the, we didn't talk at all about climate science here, but the, the incredible friction now starting to be generated as the planet begins to implode uh, physically, environmentally, may turn out to make it very difficult to muster the kinds of capital, human capital, financial capital, everything else that we need to make this transition because <coughs> An increasing amount of it everywhere around the world is just spent dealing with each of the crises that arise when the hurricane hits, when the drought hits, when the Zika virus spreads, when the, you know, on and on and on down the list. And that's one reason it feels so urgent to me that we act as close to immediately as possible because past a certain point, the, you know, we're just like we're just have the planet on a treadmill and we keep turning up the grade and upping the speed, you know, every. Well, on a certain later, we're going to get spit off the back of the treadmill. Uh, you mentioned earlier the role of divestment mm. and fighting for that. And um, I know in faith-based communities, it's a major issue mm. right now, especially yep. denominational, with yep. billions of dollars invested. Yep. And the other argument is shareholder advocacy. Yep. And um, just one of you. Sure. There are people who say, let's don't divest because what we're going to do is persuade the fossil fuel industry to change its, mm. we'll take our shares and go argue with them. I think at this point that's just greenwashing and a, a way to avoid. I mean, here's here's I guess why I need, in the end I think that one of the people who groups that have divested were the heirs to the Rockefeller fortune. Okay, um, their charities, which have billions of dollars worth of assets, in the last couple of years have announced that they're divesting them from fossil fuel. Uh, the heirs to the most you know the original fossil fuel fortune, they said. We have spent years talking constantly with the executives at Exxon, which is, in effect, our family company. Okay? And we've gotten nowhere with them. We can't get them to change. It's not possible. And it's because shareholder engagement and advocacy works very well when there's a problem around the edges of a business. Apple doesn't pay its Chinese workers enough, and so they're you know, living in dire poverty. Okay, we can solve that. We put some pressure on Apple, run some shareholder campaigns, some maybe a consumer boycott threat, something like that. And so Apple pays a living wage to people in China, and the price of an iPhone goes up a buck, and everybody's you know fine or better anyway. Um, um, this is different. The problem with the fossil fuel industry is not that there's a flaw in the business plan. The flaw is the business plan. Okay because the only business plan they've got is dig more stuff up and burn it. And at this point, the scientists have said that that's the thing that violates the laws of physics now. You've got to stop burning things on this earth or else the whole thing shouldn't match is up, you know? So that's why divestment has been such a powerful thing and it's been amazing to watch. When we started this campaign three years ago, we thought it would take a very long time and be very difficult. One of the question was apartheid, the last big example of this 25 years ago. It took eight or nine years before any university started doing it. Well, we're three years into it, and asset endowments and portfolios worth $3.4 trillion have now divested. So, you know, University of Washington system, in fact, uh, UW started divesting coal in the University of California system. Uh, but. Uh, you know, yesterday Yale started down this road, Stanford, Oxford, Sydney, Edinburgh, you know, uh, Georgetown, uh, on and on and on and on. Uh, big religious denominations, as you point out, the Episcopalians, the Unitarians, the United Church of Christ, but also players like the biggest insurance companies in France and Germany, saying we're taking, insurers have the biggest, some of the biggest pools of capital in the world. And we're not going to, makes no sense for us anymore to be investing this in coal plants because that's what 
which screws up the climate. I sense that we have come to an end. We have. We have maybe one last question. One last question. One last question. One last question. All right, you call it. So I've got two more hands to choose from. You're the. You're supposed to be a political. This gentleman down here has had his hand up for a while. So uh, here's the business sense that I see. It. Suppose we get a lot of big institutions that have some fossil fuels, maybe enough to drive down stock prices a little bit. But the revenues keep coming in. The companies are still profitable. They buy up their own shares. They're happy. Well, they're not happy though, because the problem is, remember, the, the theory is never we're going to bankrupt them okay, mm -hmm. by selling their shares for just the reason we say someone else buys them. The point of the divestment thing is to remove, in effect, their social license. Mm -hmm. So every time people, prominent people, and institutions that people know and trust and look at to sort of send signals, withdraw from engagement with them, it sends the signal that this is not the future. So. When Peabody Coal filed yesterday for bankruptcy, you have to put out a sort of set of technical papers about why you went bankrupt. And one of the things they said was divestment had raised the cost of capital. Mm -hmm. You know, it became difficult for us to find people who wanted to invest in our stupid failing business. They didn't put that part in. But um, you know, that's that's in essence what was starting to happen. And Coal was the easiest mark, and it will spread now into oil and gas. So if we get further along, it already is. So quickly, the underlying point that I wanted to push was uh, I'm curious when the divestment movement moves into uh, uh, consumer level. Into boycotts and things? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think ever. I, I, this is a good place to end because the pro we have a very short period of time to work. Okay. If we go out, if, our, if what we do is go out and try to get people to boycott Exxon, or something. We maybe can get three or four percent of people to do that. It's a huge organizing drive. The only time a boycott ever really worked was Cesar Chavez and Table Grapes. And the main reason it worked is because Table Grapes go, they rot two weeks after they're picked if you know someone doesn't buy them, okay? Which is not true of oil. You can keep it in the tank for a very long time. Um, um, but if we can get three or four percent of people to somehow well, that three or four percent doesn't translate very much in terms of CO2. If we can get three or four percent of people <coughs> deeply engaged in this political fight, that should be enough to enact the structural and systemic change, like a price on carbon, that then ripple out throughout the whole. If we had 50 years, then individual action on that level would be exactly the way to go, given that we have much less time than that. In essence, we're throwing a Hail Mary pass and hoping that we can make the structural changes in time to enact really broad scale change. That's why politics in the end is far more important than individual behavior. It's important to change your light bulbs and ride a bike to school and whatever, but the most important thing an individual can do in this stuff is not be an individual. It's joined together with other people to exercise power, which is what we call politics which is why it's been a great pleasure to get to meet you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all for coming out. And thank our partners again and bringing you Bill McKibben. And join me once again in thanking you.